evening, everyone, and uh, thanks very much to uh, Boulder County Crest for inviting me tonight. And thanks to all of you, actually, for being interested and passionate about this topic, because uh, as we'll discuss, I think it's actually one of the most important uh, areas for us to be thinking and working actively on. So um, as uh, Chris mentioned, I have a sort of diverse portfolio. I'm kind of the cleanup batter in a way in our team. We do a lot of different things related to this. Well, it's good to see some of my friends here. Hi, David. Um, so I carry a number of different uh, energy project portfolios, but one of the ones that I'm really excited about right now is our work to try to provide alternatives to our community around the use of natural gas. Uh, I should say, in fact, I get kicked every time by some of my colleagues when I use the term natural gas. Um, as some of you know, that was a very well-crafted marketing term that came out about the time I was five years old. And in fact, it was so well done that I can still recite the tagline that I learned when I was about four, which is, you know, natural gas, the light blue flame that lights, heats, and cools instantly and inexpensively at the touch of a dial. You wonder about your children when you start seeing that kind of thing. So um, I've got really three major points that I want to leave you with tonight. Uh, the first is that climate change is happening faster and more intensively than we originally believed. And that as a consequence, if we want to stabilize climate in a condition that's livable for our species, the work we have to do over the next 10 to 15 years is actually more important than the rest of the work in, our, in the rest of the century because of that flywheel effect of accumulated emissions. The second point is, we now understand that methane gas has a much greater impact on climate than we originally understood. And that as a consequence, to stabilize climate, we have to rapidly develop and disseminate alternatives to the use of methane. And then the third is that there are alternatives, and what we need right now is leadership in adoption of those so that we can both show that it's possible and to start building the economies of scale that will make those alternatives more and more economically viable for everyone. So those are those three points. Climate change is happening faster than we thought. Methane's a larger part of it than we thought. And there are alternatives that we need to actively promote. And that part of the reason I'm happy about being here is because I'm hoping that part of you or all of you are a part of the leadership in that. So I just want to give a, a little bit of a snapshot about the last 10 years. How many of you recognize this? This is not. Actually, my son could be doing this. He's, he's this age now, and he loves to run around. And, but this is actually a part of an ad that was done back in the day when we were first starting the municipalization campaign. Because it's always been a little bit of a David and Goliath struggle against Excel in terms of who, whether we were going to get a chance to form our own utility. And as you all know, last November, our community voted once again to enable the city to continue to pursue the formation of a utility. Why would we want to do that? Well, in part because we need to actually figure out how we can accelerate the development of both renewable source and the adoption of the things that use renewable electricity. So here's all the things that we've been working on over the past 10 years. But you'll notice that the, the gas wasn't a part of that initially. So this is, this is to the point of, of, of climate change. Th these are a couple of very prominent uh, climate scientists. And I'm not expecting you to read all this. But basically, and this is James White, who's here at CU. The point of this is, we're starting to see that climate change is happening faster than we thought, and it's becoming a compounding effect. So we absolutely have to work now as fast as we can. That work is, in, the work that we've proposed for our community is encapsulated in a document called the Climate Commitment, which if you go onto our city website, in fact, you can just type in Boulder Climate Commitment, you'll find this document. And what it does is it lays out our strategy, which has basically three broad areas of action. Energy systems change, ecosystems, and how we work with the natural world to start taking climate, uh, carbon back out of the atmosphere, and then, of course, how we're using resources. We can't continue to live in a world in which we just use and throw away. We have to create a circular economy. So tonight, I'm going to talk exclusively about the energy aspects of this, but we might want to have a conversation later down the road around some of the other work that we're doing. We're starting to do some really exciting work now about how we take carbon back out of the atmosphere. And one of the messages that's important for you to know is that creating a zero emissions economy will not be enough to stabilize climate. We actually have to start removing carbon from the atmosphere as well. That's actually in all the climate projections, whether we've seen that or not. So this is a very important topic and something it would be fun to talk about. And that there's some very exciting work that, that's being done there. But tonight, again, I want to talk exclusively about the energy aspects. 
So when you're talking to people about this challenge that we face, one of the things we like to suggest is that it's actually pretty simple. The energy systems change that we need to create is really just about three things. We have to create renewable electricity. We have to be as efficient as we can about the use of that electricity. And then we have to convert everything that we have that is using energy as much as possible into electricity. Now, there are some things like process heat uses in manufacturing for which we don't have a good alternative to gas right now. Some of those things are emerging, high arc furnaces and so on. So there will be probably some remnant use of, of fossil fuels for some time into the future. But there are the majority of the things that we use energy for right now can be converted into electricity. And that's an important part of this, this journey. So again, why, is nat why, why are we now so focused on natural gas? Wasn't it just a few years ago that methane gas was considered the bridge fuel? It was the cleaner alternative. Well, one of the things that we didn't know enough about at that time as we were doing those calculations is that the, the level of impact on the climate from methane was based on a few key statistics. One of them was, what's the uh, duration of impact of that gas in the atmosphere? And the way it was previously calculated, and the way it's calculated in the inventory that Boulder and almost every other city in the, in the world uses, is averaging that impact over 100 years. So every molecule of methane that's released, its impact is calculated, is averaged across 100 years. In fact, methane's residence in the atmosphere is only 12 years, and that the most, the most reasonable duration to use in calculating that impact is 20 years. And so you can imagine if you take that sum of impact and you condense it down to 20 years, it's a far greater impact than if you spread it out over 100. So that averaging has been an inaccuracy. And then the other big factor, which I'm sure you've heard about, is leakage rates. How much gas is being leaked when it's being produced, when it's being transmitted through big pipelines, when it's being distributed across in, in, our, in our neighborhoods. Our calculations currently are based on a leakage rate of 1.5%. The studies that have been coming out recently show leakage rates as high as 12% and that a very good piece of work that was done by the city of San Francisco recently called Methane Math, which you can find on the web if you, if you use that, basically takes those two factors, the duration of impact in the atmosphere, and the, and the correct leakage rate, which we think is now more like 4.5%, so four times what the original calculation was. What this adds up to, and the reason this is important, is basically methane gas is 80 times more damaging to the climate than CO2. And by that calculation, it actually may be true that methane gas is actually as damaging or more damaging than coal. Excuse me. I just read that uh, methane is, one, uh, is the main uh, constituent of natural gas. So what else is, is in natural gas? It, it is primarily methane. Okay. I mean, so what we should be saying is when you heat, when you're fur you have a methane furnace in your house. Right. You have a methane water heater right in your house. That's the way we should talk about it. Yep. Um, so so the, the point is, it's, it's 80 plus times more uh, powerful. But forget for a moment, and, and actually this may be one of the last times that I mentioned climate in my conversation tonight. Let's just talk about our local considerations, our local environmental concerns, our household impacts. So a study just came back from Boulder County in which they were assessing the leakage rates and the health impacts of methane gas development in Boulder County. Talking about leakage rates, 65% of the wells that were drilled in Boulder County were found to have leakage. The health analysis suggests that people living within 500 feet, about two football fields distance from a well operation, are eight times more likely to have a cancer in their lifetime than those around them. They've seen very similar effects in terms of birth, low birth weights around pregnant women. There's just a, a rapidly growing sense that this is actually a, a very strong local issue. Is there a map of all the wells in the state? There is, there is. And if you wouldn't mind, if you'll just hold the questions until the end, that'd be great. The, the last piece I want to just mention is that, that marketing that was done to us years ago that convinced us to start using methane gas in our houses didn't actually... Uh, take into effect and didn't remind us that as our houses age and all those appliances age, they actually start to become more efficient, they start to leak, and there's actually substantial leakage inside homes, as well as 
the, the combustion byproducts that are taking place. So it's actually been found that um, there are significant health risks because of the burning of that gas in our house. So that's one of the reasons why in our climate action plan, we actually have a, an intention to help support our community to transition entirely or almost entirely off natural gas by 2050. So, but one of the things that we have acknowledged is that while the technologies exist, that we believe it's quite doable to get our households off natural gas to a very large extent by 2050, it's gonna be more challenging in the commercial and industrial area. And that's an area where a number of you who are engineers, I hope, will spend a fair amount of time helping to develop those kinds of innovations. So I'm not gonna to try to show you this video tonight because of the sound linkages, but I would just note that we have some great videos of people who've made this journey, one of them who happens to be sitting in the back. So David Takahashi, in the red in the back, this, this video is actually a profile of David and the journey that he took in his own household to find ways to take his household off of methane gas. So let's talk about the technology. What is a heat pump? A heat pump, so the technology that we're promoting or suggesting for how we would transition homes off the use of methane gas, especially in heating and cooling, is a heat pump. Now there are two types of heat pumps. There are heat pumps that use the latent heat of the earth, so ground source heat pumps, and there are heat pumps that use the latent heat of air, air source heat pumps. If you had the money, and in some situations it actually pencils out very well, ground source heat pumps are fantastic technology. But it's quite expensive because you have to drill wells or you have to lay lines in a significant area. And in the last few years, Huge improvements have occurred in air source heat pumps. This is a, it's kind of a wild thing, but if you think about it, you'll start to realize that you're familiar with this because almost all of you live in, well, in fact, I would argue probably all of you live in structures that has an operating heat pump right now. Do you know what that is? Your refrigerator. Refrigerator, right? That's, that's basically, you ever wonder how this box in your house is creating ice when it's room temperature? It's kind of a miracle in a certain kind of way. Well, no, it's a heat pump. And so uh, I am not an engineer, and so I am not going to butcher the explanation of compression and all the things that go into a heat pump. But I will say that basically what it can do is it can take, the air, it can take heat out of air and transfer it into a location, or it can take heat out of that location and send it outside. And so one of the great things about a heat pump is it can heat or cool. So one of the little pieces of news for you to use if you want to, when you're talking to people about the changes that are going to take place in our environment. I'm not going to even use the term climate change. I'm just going to say the changes that are taking place in our environment from, night, from up to about 2000, Boulder had on average five days of the summer over 95 degrees. My, my wife's a native and she, she's like, I hear all the time, like, it didn't used to get so hot here. And actually that is true. On average, we're two degrees warmer now than we were historically. But the more important thing, and averages are not what gets you in climate change, it's actually about extremes. So the number of days over 95 up to the year 2000 in Boulder was four to five. That has already doubled. We now have eight to nine days over 95 on average. The trajectory that we're on says that that will double again in the next 10 years, and that by mid-century, Boulder will face something like 30 to 40 days over 95. Now, I have a 12-month-old child. Already, my little three-bedroom house here in Boulder was essentially almost unlivable last summer, and it was not so bad last summer. So what, over 50% of the houses in Boulder don't have air conditioning. This ability to provide not only heating but cooling is actually going to be an important local, immediate, tangible, personal benefit. And frankly, folks, that's what we probably have to sell folks on in terms of the actions that we need to take. Because when it comes down to it, are you going to spend an extra two or 3000 bucks to save the climate? Or are you going to do that because it actually will keep your household more comfortable and, and ultimately be a, a safer and healthier environment? So again, a heat pump can be used for either of these. So how, what does it look? I don't, some of you probably have seen this. In fact, if you once you know what you're looking for, you'll notice you see them a lot more than you think. It's an outdoor compressor unit. This is the unit that actually does this kind of exchange process that then runs two refrigerant lines into, well, there's two, there are two types. This is called a ductless mini split. So that unit will be placed on a wall somewhere in a room, or you can actually have ceiling cassettes, or they actually have wall-mounted units. This is a sort of zone approach. 
or they do make central furnace uh, systems as well. But this is the kind of classic um, uh, system for a, a, a heat pump. They also make hot water heat pumps. And there are actually some great new systems out there. In fact, Rheem um, makes a system that's about to be carried by uh, Home Depot. And then we're working with them to get a display put together for Home Depot. I hope in the next month that that'll be up. Um, Lowe's sells an AO Smith unit um, that's going to be online. In fact, now Excel just came out with $450 instant rebates for both this, uh, the Rheem unit and the AO Smith unit that you can get either at Lowe's or Home Depot. So anyway, you can do both your heating and cooling and your water heating. If by chance you happen to have an existing electric water heater, these units are three times more efficient. They will literally, if you have an electric water, this thing will pay for itself in a year and a half or less. So, and again, I was gonna say, this is not new technology. You've seen these around. This is actually Red Oaks, the affordable housing uh, development over on uh, Belmont. They put in a bunch of um, LG units in that. That was back in 2011, I think. This is the new Boulder Housing Partner development. They have carrier units that are going in there. So a lot of times you'll see these, they're only being used for air conditioning. So there is differences, and then you actually have to be careful to make sure that the units that you're getting, especially in our environment, are um, high efficiency units that are designed for doing low temperature heating. Um, so believe it or not though, these units, which are literally heating with the latent heat of the air can operate down to 15 below. I don't, it, to me it's a miracle that you could draw enough heat out of the air when it's that cold, but they literally can do that. So here is the list of benefits. So we're launching a campaign. Um, do we have the campaign? We're launching a campaign called Comfort 365 that just launched uh, two weeks ago to provide incentives, and I'll get into how many, what kind of incentives we have. To, to support the community in moving this in direction. Now, what you'll find interesting, perhaps, is do you see climate mentioned anywhere here? No, it's, it's about comfort, it's about health, it's about flexibility. By the way, these things can be operated off of your smartphone. You could operate your, either your water heater or your heating and cooling system from remote. Let's say you wanted to actually make your house colder or warmer an hour before you were gonna get home. You could do that right off of your phone. The, the water heater unit will send you an alert if it's leaking. They're, they're remarkable pieces of technology. And for those of you who are energy engineers, of course, the water heaters are basically thermal storage. They are energy storage units, which could be used in that way as well. So that they're, they are more efficient than, than typical electric systems. They lower your carbon footprint, and there's a lot of incentives now available. So again, the benefits, um, I'll tell you one of the reasons, my, my son, uh, Nathaniel, who's five, we, when, we were, uh, when he was first born, we lived in a trailer for the first two years of his life. That was a classic trailer. It had a um, gas water heater and a gas furnace. And in the wintertime, it was very cold. So we would have to, of course, button the whole house up. We would even put a, a towel you know, along the seam of his door because we had a little uh, portable heater in his room. And my son's now pre-asthmatic. I don't know if you know this, but asthma rates among children are skyrocketing. Part of it is our very bad exterior air quality. The front range is some of the worst in the Rocky Mountain region. But a lot of it is actually indoor air quality, and I'm frankly fairly convinced and sort of ashamed that it was probably because of the kind of internal air quality that my son has that condition. So it really is an issue, especially for our, the people who are most vulnerable, kids and elders. And speaking of that, one of the things about these heat pumps is that they come with onboard air filtration. How many of you have lived in Boulder during a forest fire? Remember how terrible the air quality can get here? So not only will this unit provide cooling, but it actually can provide some indoor air quality improvements, which believe me, when we hit the next fire cycle, which is coming, people will really appreciate this. So in terms of carbon benefits, I'll just do this really quickly for the energy engineers in the room. We did an analysis to say, would this unit reduce your household carbon emissions against uh, when compared to a regular low efficiency gas unit or a high efficiency gas unit? So against a low efficiency gas unit, right now it's a little bit close, like at, at the carbon uh, emissions factor of our electricity uh, against the natural gas, incorrectly, by the way, calculated, you're still a little bit more emissions because you're gonna use a little more electricity. But by the time we get to, this is basic, basically uh, all of the projections of what the Excel grid is gonna do. So this is just basically up to about 40% renewables uh, in the Excel grid. 
we're already beating regular natural gas units by 20, actually this should be 2020, not 2030. Um, if we were uh, replacing a high efficiency gas furnace, um, heat pumps replace high efficiency gas furnace, uh, we're beating it out in almost all cases, low efficiency. So uh, if you wanna see the numbers behind this, I'm happy to share it with you. But the point of this is, with the trends in the renewable grid, we're gonna be better on carbon very soon. Now, this, I have to make sure I say this, this is not a perfect solution. There are no perfect solutions. For one thing, it uses refrigerants. How many of you have seen Paul Hawkins' book, Drawdown? So what's the number one thing in Drawdown? Refrigerants, right? So um, one of the important innovations that we're trying to push in this field is for the manufacturers to start using better refrigerants. So Boulder's actually partnered with 20 other cities across the country and most of the major heat pump manufacturers to say, we're gonna build market for you, but we need you to build products that actually are, are good in the long run. The units that Dave put into his house are done by a Japanese company named Sandin who's using CO2 as their refrigerant. So that's actually a fantastic step forward. We hope to see a lot more going that way. So, but again, it's not perfect. It's still evolving. There's still more work to be done. So what does this look like in the context of Boulder? Well, in Boulder, about 35,000, uh, let's see, so we have hydronics, 3,000, these are basically gas units and gas units. So we're at, at mm, almost 40,000 of our 40,000 homes. There's, there's maybe eight, we think there's about six to 800 heat pumps in use now. So we've got a little bit of room for improvement. Uh, this is how we calculated that amount that we have now. So this is the campaign we've just launched. This spring, the focus is a lot about cooling because a lot of houses don't have cooling. But once that unit is in the house, it actually has the opportunity to be a part of the heating system. And then that's what we, it starts to create that opportunity for displacing the existing gas use without having to replace it. So this is an important distinction to make. If we were trying to say to everybody, go out right now and replace your entire gas furnace with heat pumps, uh, it, in, in most cases it could be done, but in many cases it would be prohibitively expensive. Like in my house, I got a quote for a full replacement. It was actually $12,000. That was a non-starter with my wife, believe me. I actually think that putting one central ductless, or one ductless mini split in my house will actually displace the majority of my heat need and will provide all of my cooling need so that I maybe have knocked my heating uh, loads down by 70%. That works out well. I can figure out how to do that next configuration so I can incrementally move my way off, off of my natural gas use. So we're really focusing on a displacement campaign right now as opposed to a replacement campaign. So then we'll, we'll do this again in the uh, winter time where we change the focus to a kind of uh, heating focus. So for those of you who are interested, by the way, I have flyers here. This is a program that we're doing in partnership with our county energy smart program. So one of the great things about this is you actually can get a personalized energy advisor to walk you through this process, help you connect to the contractors that are doing this work, help you connect to the various incentives that are available and basically decide whether this is a good program or not for you. So let me talk a little bit about the incentives that we're putting on the table. So this is city of Boulder. We also are working with Boulder County that's providing incentives, Excel is providing incentives, and then Mitsubishi, the manufacturer, is launching a parallel initiative in which they're putting some rebates on the table as well. So how does it stack up? So in terms of the city, for the heat pump, the heating and cooling unit, we are providing an incentive up to $350. The county is about 300, up to 300. Um, Excel has a $300 incentive and Mitsubishi has a $300 incentive. So right there on the heating and cooling unit, you might have a total incentive package of over $1,000. The, the deals are actually especially good right now on the water heaters, partly because Excel is putting so much on the table for those. So that again is close to $900. A, a water heater, I don't know what they're gonna run at, at Home Depot, but my guess is that that's, do, do you know? Yeah, that's that's true. That's a good point. That's a good point. Um, and we've been. It makes me wonder about the rest of the utilities out there. That sounds not Yeah. So we've we've been very clear about what the standards for our rebates are. But the advisors through Energy Smart, I hope will. And I'm glad you reminded me of that. That is an issue. And we've been asking Excel to consider reconsider that. But that's a good point. Yeah. So there there is 
there is a, a size limit right now around what hot water heater they're, they're supporting. So just what would it look like to be successful in this? So this is an adopt, sort of a compilation of adoption curves for other disruptive technologies. And the point I want you to see in this is just that it goes slow initially when you're seeing a disruptive technology take over. Like you'll hear, well, they're not making much progress, you're not seeing much sales, until you hit some kind of critical mass when your early adopter wave starts to influence the rest of the market, and then it really takes off. So the blue line is what it looked like for cell phones, the yellow line is solar, um, this is the electric vehicle curve right now. So, you can, so this is the kind of curve that we're trying to create. These are, are actually our uh, adoption targets for the city of Boulder. So for 2018, we're looking at hopefully somewhere around 100 to 120 um, water heaters and about 60 of the, air, of the um, heating and cooling units. So that, and what's important about, to note about this though is to get to the place where we start to replace anything that's starting to age out. So the good news around this is that everybody's water heater and, and hot water uh, and furnace is gonna die. It's like, that's good. that's good, right? It's good news. Because they all, hopefully they'll all get replaced with something else. The point is we need to actually get it to the point that it's the thing that everybody wants to replace with. And for us to hit our goal, we have to be at the point where that's happening at, by 2030. So that by 2030, we need to be making such a, a, a compelling value proposition to people that that's the choice that they want and that that's what the people on, have on the truck. Because I'll tell you also one thing right now. Think about your water heater. When do you change your water heater? It's not because you have some preventative maintenance you know, schedule in your back pocket and say, oh, when would I want it? Oh, honey, did I tell you that you know, a year from now we're gonna change your water? No. You're going to change it probably in November, December, or January because it's going to go out right before all your relatives show up for a major event. Or if it's your furnace, it's going to be the middle of the night on the coldest night of winter. And you know what you're going to do? You're going to call up some HVAC unit and say, get over here right away and put something else in. And I will guarantee you that right now, it's not going to be a heat pump that they have on the truck. So one of the things that we're doing a lot of right now is to work with those industries to try to find ways to have them be ready with this technology. In fact, tomorrow I'm going to two plumbing distributors to help give presentations to plumbers about why they should be promoting these technologies. So I just want to put this work in context. Um, Boulder actually helped to launch this initiative nationally, and now we have a whole bunch of cities that are joining in with us, and we are literally meeting with all of the major heat pump manufacturers that are providing these kinds of products in the United States to say, look, we can build markets of literally millions of people. We can literally walk you through the front doors of a lot of people if you will help by bringing prices down, improving the quality of your contractors, by making more and better products available. Did you? When you add uh, air source or ground source heat pump, you don't get any ability of increasing the size of a solar array. Like an electric vehicle, if you have an EV registered at the address, you can increase your rate three kilowatts. Is there an incentive? Package? We're we're working on it. That's a really good point. Let's come back to that in discussion. It's a really good question, though. Um, so I just want to. Uh, get, I'm getting close to the end here, but I want to point out something that's really important. One of the things I'm really excited about in terms of Cress is that you're taking the big and the holistic view. For a long time, we've been looking at these things piecemeal. Like, okay, let's go promote a lot of solar, or let's go and let's all do energy efficiency. Those are all really good things to do but sometimes it actually is doing things together that make them work. And a good example is actually heat pumps. If, for example, you were interested in an electric uh, water heater heat pump, most of you would soon find out, damn it, my water heater is getting gas, but there's no 220 outlet in that room. Plus, my electrical panel might not have enough service to be able to support that. When would you potentially be talking to somebody who could help you with that? Oh, actually, when they're installing solar, right? You're going to have an electrician in there. They could pull a new line. They could make sure it goes there, and they could size it to the right one. So it's the synergies that actually will make these things work. In fact, we found that putting solar on the house and lowering your average cost of electricity is what actually makes these things cost competitive to gas. So I'll just, I'll just breeze through all these. Let me see if I can. We've basically developed, for those of you who are modeling geeks, um, we have developed an hourly energy model for every single family residence in town so that we could do financial modeling of for whom it might make sense to do these improvements. 
So we literally have built a tool in which we can say, show me all the houses that are in the 1960s or 1950s that are of a certain size, that have a certain fuel type, that, and then we can run the, the, the cost-benefit analysis and say, okay, this many houses actually cash flow at night, and we can then turn that into a mailing list that we can talk to. So there's a lot of really fun things that we're starting to be able to do with all this. So this is the last part. So we literally have this tool now called the Roadmap to Renewable Living. So if you give us your address and you give us, actually, if you gave me your address today, I could give you a roadmap that would say, here's what we know about your house and here's what the likely changings, uh, the, the change out periods, because we have all the permit data. Now, to the extent that the permits are in there, we know when your water heater and your furnace might be ready to go. So we could start to say, look, it, not maybe today, but two or three years from now, you really ought to be thinking about changing out that furnace or that boiler. And if you are, then might want to look at this. And in fact, when you're doing that, you might want to look at this too. And we could finance that together and stretch that out over 10 or 15 years. And suddenly, it actually makes good sense. You, 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 you don't spend any more money to get all those things that you wanted. So that's why this notion of thinking about a roadmap for your house from here to that point where you're basically on a renewable living set situation is where we want to go. So uh, for those of you who really want to be on the leading edge with us too, we're actually launching an initiative to do some actual monitoring houses. We're putting air quality monitors in and doing health assessments with those households and hoping that a number of those households are actually going to make this journey of putting in these electric heat pumps so that we can see if there is a difference in the air quality inside and whether that has a corresponding health effect. And then we're also putting in our uh, um, energy monitors uh, in those houses so that we can look at the behavior of these things on an hourly basis. So I want to close with this. If we want a system to change, and this, you could talk about this in terms of energy, but basically any system, I would say you need five things. First of all, you need to have awareness that we need to change. We've been running around for 15 years sort of berating people to say, don't you know about climate change? We've got to do something about it. And so we've been thinking that if you just had the awareness that that would be enough. Well, we actually need to have compelling alternatives for them, too. But then it's actually not even enough to have a compelling alternative. Like I might say to you, you know, a heat pump is fantastic. You say, great, it sounds nice, but how do I adopt it? Like, I don't know how to do that. And where would I go? And who do I talk to? And how would it go? And so you need adoption support for that. Now, even if you have all three of these things, you still might not get the change because it's still too easy to do the thing you've always done. That's where policy comes in. That's why we're doing some things that start to make it a little bit harder to do the things that have always been done. But finally, and this is where you can come in, you still have to have all these things and look around and notice that all the people that you respect are doing that new thing. So how do you do that? You have events like this. You talk about these things. You, you actually post things on your Facebook about that new step that you took. You do videos of other people. You start to make it so that everywhere you turn, you notice that everybody else is doing this. So, oh, gosh, I guess I might as well do it too. So uh, these are just some of the things. So raising awareness, developing and developing uh, options and support. So this is, by the way, adoption support. This is what we've spent 10 years doing. The energy advisors in the Energy Smart program are this adoption support. Our new... Um, energy codes, which are going to require that all new houses and all rate major remodels have to be net zero by 2030 or a part of this friction. But finally, we're not very good at the city and in public institutions in general in helping to shape norms. That's going to be stuff that we need you guys to help with. So if it's not here, then where? If it's not us, then who? If it's not now, when? Right? So I hope that you'll be at least interested in this topic after this presentation. And if you're really interested, Get a flyer, um, talk to me or others afterwards, and keep doing this great work of showing up and, and making this happen. So thanks a lot. So comments, questions, go ahead. A, a little bit more information on the solar to tie in. With yeah. The increase in the size of the system, you know your electricity use with the right. income is going to go up 30 40% yeah. minimum. Yeah. Okay? So, so achieve the same comfort that you're trying to deliver for your family. And if you put solar and a heat pump on at the same time, you can't really size your solar system appropriately. So there needs to be action, just like the EV, 3,000 kilowatts on additional solar, 250 kilowatt hours a month at equates 3K. When you put solar and the heat pump and change the electricity to make it work, you're maximizing your tax credit depending on how you write the contract up and how you do it. The company that I work for right now does that, where it bundles the whole thing together, and you really can add a couple of thousand dollars worth of tax credits 
if you're a company that does the whole yeah. gamut because yeah. of the way you can write the contract. So I'm very curious to see yeah. if they're allowing or there's motions in place to increase the size of a solar array when you put a heat pump and PV at the same time. Yeah, so we've started that conversation with Excel. Like we asked them, <laughs> well, believe it or not, Excel actually has a whole new unit based out of Minneapolis on electrification. They've, they've staffed a team that's supposed to be looking at electrification. This is an interesting step for a utility that actually provides gas. But that unit has told me, look, we know internally that gas is ultimately going away. They actually make bigger margins on electricity anyway. The only thing that they make money on with gas is building more infrastructure, which we don't want them to do, right? So they know this is where that's going. But, th but this is actually a role for Cress, and it's a role for COSI, and it's a role for others. We need you to be advocating to the Public Utilities Commission to start pushing Excel to actually create these allowances for those systems. Because right now, what's going to have to happen, and we just, uh, I don't know, some of you might have seen, we did a Facebook Live event at a house here in Boulder. And this is a guy who basically put in his heat pumps. Well, actually, what he did is he put in electric baseboard heaters, and he ran them like for 24 hours a day for two months so that he could jack his bill up so then he could go. And isn't that crazy? And then, then he would go, right, and, and get, now he had a higher amount of electricity use, and he could get a larger solar unit. So crazy, right? Right, right. But, but what I'm saying is we need to advocate on this. And it's one of those things, again, where we haven't thought about these things together. We keep thinking about them separately. We did start to get, oh, electric vehicles and solar, I get that. Now we need to go to the next step. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. For, for future questions, can you make sure to repeat the questions? Sure. That the yeah, you bet. More questions. I see skeptics in the back. Come on, I got, I, give me the skeptics. Give me the... No, 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 I was uh, going to follow his idea, but I, I wanted to uh, add the, the snippet that everything he talked about was residential consumption. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, the way to succeed is that is uh, the early adapters should be the churches, the cities, the counties, the uh, people that are in it for long haul. I'm not going to be breathing much longer, you know. I'm not considered a long-term asset anymore. Uh, the city's going to be here much la much longer than I will, you know. Uh, schools, every, you know, they should be adopted on the municipal level, and, and our tax code should incentivize landlords. I am a landlord also. Uh, I'm in it for the long haul. You know, I own properties for 30, 40 years. Mm -hmm. And the, the average person in this room is going to move in six years. Mm -hmm. you know, so I should be the guy getting the tax credit as solar for landlords legislation that isn't out there. I am not incentivized to do this. So one on of the, my house, yes. But on my income property, right, no. Right. One of the things that people haven't really discussed much about municipalization uh, is what that enables us to do around financing. So I would argue that, in fact, one of the most important and powerful aspects of municipalizing is that we can actually do on-bill financing and stretch the cost of improvements out over enough years that it actually is accessible and doable and then create special programs if we want to for different classes of users that we want to try to incent. It's a huge, it's just a huge, we have a, basically an intergenerational equity issue around this. Most of, those of us who own homes are being asked essentially to take a unit that's now basically 50 plus years old and really needs a significant upgrade to bring it into the century that we want it to live in, but we're not gonna benefit from it for all the years that those upgrades create, right? We need to find a way that the payments for that are shared with the whole set of users that are going to have that. That's what financing against your property or financing against your meter could do. So there, was a, there is a program called Property Assessed Clean Energy Financing where you can take all those improvements, pay for them, stretch that payment across 20 years, and make that a tax lien so that it follows with whoever owns the home. There's actually several other mechanisms like that, but that's what we need. We need a finance, this is, this is not a technology issue anymore in terms of this transition, it's entirely a financing issue. It's how we pay for this thing that we need to do. Others, yes? Yeah, I mean, just, so I understand you're in the city of Boulder. Um, I, I live in Superior, and I'm just curious, are other surrounding 
drawing town and city agreement and town and city type of programs that Boulder has and then also to what extent do they share that with Right. Yeah, yeah, thank you. So so the city often um, my colleagues in the county are sometimes a little uh, anxious when they see us coming because we're like, hey, we've got a new idea for you. This whole thing, like, oh my God, really? You want to try that? But now, because of this program, those incentives that I showed you are available to all the cities in the county. So this program is being offered by Energy Smart to all the county. Now, the, our, our city incentives are for, only for residents, but all the rest of them are for everybody in the county. So in terms of other cities, like I mentioned, we're actively collaborating with other cities who are watching us, like Fort Collins is watching us because they want to run in a similar direction. Other communities, I don't know where they're at yet here, but we have a lot of the major cities around the country now working with us. So. Other, please. What is the, uh, in this area, what is the average uh, coefficient of performance of the air source you pump? Um, wow, there, I knew I should be more prepared. I'm, I'm not the engineer in the crowd. The, let me see if I can go back to the, what we're, the ones that are installed now are the ones that we're actually incenting. Well, the latest and greatest models are here. So here's the efficiency levels. We're going to incent um, the uh, over 10 uh, EER, over 18 COP um, units on the um, performance. So these are, we're only incenting the high efficiency units or the mid-scale efficiency units. So these are like the Mitsubishi Hyperheats, Daikin makes units that will qualify for this. So if you're interested in that, Panasonic, Mitsubishi, or um, Fujitsu, I'm not gonna, I can't talk about better or worse, right? So there's just, but there are, there are, at, least a, there are at least a dozen companies that offer units that can meet these high efficiency standards. The high efficiency standards run about 30% higher than the medium efficiency units. In terms of cost. So, so you gotta go to the top of the price range to get the higher efficiency, yeah. so. Yeah, just, just a second, Lynn, I saw the hand right here. I have one quick question on one point. Just, what are the, like, what is the ballpark cost? What's the yeah, yeah, so um, last summer I had a whole bunch of guys come out to quote my house. For a single ductless mini unit in my house, it was on average five to $6,000. So. How many square feet? was to serve a house, a, a room area that was in the sort of 500 square feet area in size. So they, they make units that, that could serve a little 120 square foot unit, or, or I mean, they get quite big. So you could serve a whole thousand square foot room if it was one room. The thing that's really brilliant about these things though is they literally have infrared eyes on them and they're super quiet, but, th but that eye will be tracking where the cold or hot spots are in rooms and it will shift the fans to direct the heating or cooling to those. They can even, this is kind of creepy, but they can even be set up to track people. So you want it to sort of track the person in the room, you sit down, but it's so quiet you won't hear it happening, but that's what's happening. So it's really interesting. Well, um, so there's two issues. There's commercial and then there's industrial. And what I was really talking about significantly was industrial. Like when somebody has to use heat to make uh, a wafer board or something, that's like two, 3,000 square degrees stuff. We can't, you can do it with an electric arc. It's just really very inefficient. So that's the thing that's really hard to replace. Commercial buildings in terms of heating and cooling are a much more mixed bag. I mean, there's all kinds of, it's not as standard as a house. So the, the technologies aren't quite as far along and they're a little bit more expensive, but there still are some good choices. So we're starting, we've started on the residential side. We're now getting everybody together to start researching the best technologies for the commercial side. And there's some really cool buildings going up in town, like Boulder Commons is going in, heat pumps. They're basically a net zero facility. So you're seeing it more and more coming online. Building that's over near the Boulder Junction. Um, in fact, that's a really cool building, by the way. If you haven't seen it yet, they're literally putting solar skins on the side of the building, like the whole oh, south face. Else, I, I don't remember of that. So I saw a question back here, and then to you, Lynn. Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to ask you in regards to when I look at my home, it's probably four years old. 
and the heat differential between the main level and the upper level is pretty mm -hmm. dramatic. Yeah. But it's not just a single room. You're talking, you know, three rooms up there. Right. How do you manage that with um, putting in a, a heat pump system? Right. And is that feasible to set it in the attic right. and be able to manage three different rooms? Right. So there are units that um, you can set into the, the, the uh, attic and then duct into multiple rooms. So I was just at an Airbnb in Eugene where they did that with two rooms. It was actually in a wall cavity, and then they had uh, registers out into two rooms. So you can, I think, get them to serve two to three rooms out of a single unit. So, and there are these central units that are literally like a drop-in air handler that could then just go, use duct systems. So, it's not that they're less efficient, it's just that they actually don't make them to serve very large houses. About 1,500 square feet is about the biggest air handler that they've got now for centralized systems. They're coming out with bigger ones, but so that's where it can get really expensive. If you have to put a separate unit in each room, you might have a single compressor out there serving three or four of those, but then suddenly you have all that refrigerant line moving stuff, and so that's where, so right now, again, it might be that you have a really hot room that's your office or your partner just really feels like your room is always too cold in the winter. So you take and you solve that problem. Or in the case of my house, I, have, I can put one in my common room that serves my living and dining room area, and then I'm gonna set it up so that it actually literally blows down my hall, and I think I can provide all the cooling my little thousand square foot house needs. And then in the winter, I'll see how much of my gas I can displace by running that unit. We'll see, yeah. I'm just curious, um, before, what is the city planning to do for government buildings? And yeah, yeah. So the first thing that we've done is pass these really aggressive building codes. So we actually have probably the most aggressive codes in the country in terms of we're ahead of every cycle by 30% with the goal of getting to, to all new buildings and major remodels by 2030 have to be net zero. So we, we apply that to our same buildings. So on the commercial side, we have, if you might have seen, it's, it's called the... Um, building performance ordinance for commercial buildings. And it started that all buildings over 50,000 had to comply. This year, buildings over, I think, 25,000 have to comply. So we're ratcheting down to, I think, about 10,000 square feet. But all the buildings that we own that fall into that category, and believe me, it's an interesting conversation internally when Parks and Rec says, what, I have to do that? But wait a minute, that's gonna cost more money. It's like, right, that's the building code, right? So that's how we're doing it on that. And so we're trying to lead by example. So we're just as a, we, we have an, a, our objective with the community is to try to hit an 80% emissions reduction for the entire community by 2050. We're trying to get there with the city by 2030. So we want to try to walk the talk or lead by example. Um, Lynn, you were waiting. The thing that will work good is that you can scale it up and then that, that gets it projected. So it, the mass production makes it cheaper. And That's exactly that. right. And we come up with more alternatives. And Lynn is another real pioneer in this area. Bless her heart. She's been trying to figure out how to take her house and find ways to adopt these technologies. And there are certain situations where it's not straightforward and it's not easy and it's not cheap. And so I, I, I honor you and I admire you and I bow to you for being a part of trying to help figure out where we go. And it's a, a few years ago, another thing though, I realized that these things are disposable these $5,000 things, you know, but um, that's something else that might be accelerated by a more and more adoption is better technology that, you right. know, because my furnace is 50 years, you know. So, just, yeah, so think about. And these things are like 10 years or like the, a lot less. Think about where we are now in this technology as essentially where we were with solar 15 years ago. Like 15 years ago, what was solar per watt? Uh, right? And the panels, if you were lucky, were 20% efficient. Right. So we've seen, like, just in the solar hot water, or the uh, heat pump hot water heaters, the efficiencies have been probably improved 30 to 40% in the last three years. So this, the more adoption we get, the more we'll drive this. And we, but as somebody was nodding their head, we have to drive the refrigerant piece, too. That has to be part of what, where we go. So I saw the hand raking. Any divestments, or PSFs, can you make divestments into uh, fossil fuels to make something like investing in this more, more attractive? Well, that's a really good question. So um, some of you may be aware 
one of the reasons why Boulder has had the honor to be a leader in this field is because you, our community, said back in 2006, we place climate action as a high priority. And so we, as a community, decided to impose a surcharge, what we called a carbon tax, on our electricity that generates now about $2 million a year, which is what's enabled us to have a staff that's worked on this. And you know, by the way, just to note, for, for us as a community, that has really set us apart in the world because we've actually had a capacity to work on it. That's one of the reasons why we can do things that other communities are following. So it was a really beautiful and wise investment by our community. But now, isn't it weird or isn't it sort of a little bit out of uh, uh, alignment that we're still wanting to start, we're still surcharging on electricity when now actually we're saying we want people to use more electricity? What is it we don't want them to do? We don't want them to use gas. So we're trying to actually come up with a new carbon tax around gas, which is essentially sort of inviting a disinvestment in gas and a reinvestment in electricity. So we'll probably be coming back to the community with that new proposal for how we fund this work going forward in the next year to two years. So how about the refrigerants and the, the carbon footprint at the moment with the current technology? Because some of these refrigerants, you talk about methane being 80 times to go global yeah. warming potential of carbon. Some of these refrigerants are hundreds and thousands of times yeah. Yeah. more potent than carbon. Yeah. Uh, in the atmosphere. So, how does it pencil yeah. out now if you were to get a current model with current yeah. technology, knowing that's going to leak yeah. somewhat? Yeah. Yeah. That's. I honestly cannot answer that question. We're working on that, but I don't think that that's been done. And it, part of it is that every manufacturer is using, or not everyone, but they're off. They're different types across the different manufacturers. So, I, I will commit to we do continue to do that work, though. That's a really important question. In addition to that, there's businesses that are forming to take the old dirty refrigerant and produce the new ones and where they actually can dispose of it without having to have the contractor pay to dispose of it. They're actually yeah. going to make money by uh -huh. turning in their old refrigerant yeah. to have it converted to the less dirty refrigerant, so to say. Yeah, so, but it is. And that's a new business model that yeah. is just now, there's like two places in Denver that are the automobile in industry didn't even have a, a suggested method of uh, disposing of refrigerants, and yet untold millions of automobiles have been trashed for the last refrigerant. You know, yeah. and the, and guess where it all is? Yeah. So, I, but I think this this is this is an area this is an area for both entrepreneurship, but also for policy. So we are going to need to push on that question and then make sure that there's policy to try to force the collection. Yeah. You know a lot about the industrial and commercial. Well, right now there's a huge incentive in Colorado, the PACE program, property assessed mm -hmm. clean energy for the businesses mm -hmm. and industries that want to get off of gas, move to electricity, more efficient. They can utilize that. I know coming up in the next legislative session, if the idiots in the dome can ever think about things right instead of wait till the 11th hour, um, they want to put a PACE program available for residential solar and energy efficiency rolling right into the heat pump uh, yeah. thing together. So be aware that coming up the next step is going to be the PACE program for renewable energy and it'll be statewide, not just Boulder County. It's, they know it works. So. But Mike, that's a really important point and thanks for making it. So if you haven't heard, so we mentioned PACE earlier, it actually is in place now for commercial. So, um, and it's, a, it's an incredibly powerful program because let's just say you're, you have a building and you want to get solar, but you need some HVAC work, but your roof is old. You can actually bundle that entire package, including the roof repairs, into that financing package. And you package. take it off your business books, put it on your property assessments, you can accelerate the depreciation of that investment, mm -hmm. and then you got a building that's 40% more efficient than the guy right across the street. When you go to sell your building, yeah. And it, it comes off the business books. When you explain this to a CEO, they go, no way. It can't be legal. Right? Bring, it, bring in your, C, your CFO, and I'll show them how it works. And it's a huge yeah. boom. I was involved in, in Delaware, and then it was moved out here, yeah. Connecticut, and then to Colorado. So yeah. it's huge for in the industry of commercial. It, so PACE, I also know that, wait, just a second. There are, there are two PACEs. We just want to make things really confusing. So before there was property assessed clean energy financing, P-A-C-E, property assessed clean energy financing, 
the county launched its commercial energy efficiency program called Partners for a Clean Environment, PACE. So if you're in the commercial sector and you want energy assistance services, you'll go to the county to go to the PACE program to get those, that advisor, we have an advisor service for businesses in the, called the PACE program. Now, there's also this financing program called COPACE, Colorado Property Assessed Clean Energy Financing. So let's not go. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's entirely state-based, but it has to be authorized by a county because it's collected in the county tax process. So basically, you pay for this, this, this financing that you get for this, through this program, you pay off on your tax bill. That's how, and that, 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 it is almost unbelievable. Literally, like if you're a business and you want all these improvements done, it doesn't have to be off your balance sheet. This can be something because it's associated to your property. It's not associated to your business. Oh, yeah, yeah. And it's not, it's not the cheapest financing out there. But you can extend it out 20 to 25 years. And it's on your property tax that comes off your, balance, your, your book. So you're not even on it. You're, it's all on your property taxes. Yeah. So, CO, CPACE, Google it. And there's yeah. all kinds of... Yeah. So let's not go too far down in this rabbit hole. But there, if you're in that commercial... And you're right. There's, it's looking like it might come forward again for residential. We actually had it for residential for a while. And then Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac basically killed it because they didn't want to take second position on these, these loans. So, but it, it could come back. For those of you who are interested, we had a panel discussion on this. I believe it was at a March meeting. So okay. You can go to our YouTube page. Oh, perfect. You can take a look at that. We've got the director of the, of the Tracy, yeah. pace. Oh, good. Um, oh, good. Sternberger. Okay, good. Uh, and we, we've been, we're at 8.15. We'll probably take a few more questions. Go ahead. Have you done your car emissions and methane leakage calculations? For both, I understand right. if we misapplies or if the power purchase agreements become 100% electric from renewables, but if Boulder is still tied to Excel, and what, 40% uh, coal, 20% gas, and you're saying yeah. burn more, use more electricity at that type of emissions. Yeah. Is that entered into the calculations? There are two pathways? Yeah, so I. I, I realized that it was a little bit complicated. I did show a slide, and I can show you the statistics. But basically, with what Excel has projected out to be its carbon emissions mix, and it's actually conservative to what I think they're going to do, we were, we're within a couple of years of, on the current grid, being better than gas if you have a sort of standard efficiency gas appliance. If you have a high efficiency gas appliance, it's going to take a little bit longer, but will still be there by 2025 or 2030. So, and then, but if you have solar on your house, of course, it's a no-brainer. It's like it's it's already done. Yeah. And and by the way, if if you're going to go to heat pumps, I would strongly recommend looking at solar because that's what makes it completely pencil. And then, but it, but it is possible that you might want to look at. I hate to say this, but whether or not you can find an R -pace, R pace program because it, there are some financing programs that are coming out now that can extend that out so you could finance both your solar and the heat pump together for say 10 or 15 years. Yeah, you, yeah. Can, you can finance it right now with solar loans uh, up to 20 years right. at about a 499 rate. Yeah, so or, that's pretty darn good. Penciling out for 20 years. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, a lot of your data goes out in 2050, so the rates of adoption um, is have you guys calculated, is that really enough to actually do enough to make a big enough impact? Yeah, so what, what we've shown ourselves is that by 2030, every new unit that's being, every unit that's dying needs to be replaced with a heat pump, and that if we did that, we would hit our mark by 2050. For climate improvement. For our emissions reduction for our gas. And is that soon enough to actually make oh. a big enough impact in the climate? Well, after the well, Arctic data right today, today, that no. doesn't look very good. <laughs> so, so the other, like I said. I know we have to do. No. We have to do an enormous amount on the emissions reduction side. Probably, we won't go quite fast enough which is why we actually have to really get busy on carbon capture. And the issue is how we're going to do carbon capture. And this is sort of, unfortunately, like a lot of engineers are saliv salivating and starting to go to the bank waiting for, because there's going to be a lot of money thrown at this problem. 
and there are going to be wild geoengineering solutions that are proposed. And I would argue, why are we considering geoengineering solutions when the, the planet spent two billion years figuring out how to take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere? That's what it does. And there's some really good information out there that shows that if we'll just start basically working with natural systems, they can take gigatons worth of carbon back out of the atmosphere. So that's the other thing that we're starting to work really hard on. Have you guys developed a strategy yet? On that side? Yeah, for Boulder. We're just starting. So Boulder County and the city of Boulder launched its first sequestration pilot project this year. So we're literally laying out plots this June for our first land treatments to then look at what are the options? Is it biochar? Is it bioinoculums? Is it mineralization? Because it's all about basically feeding the microbial life that's going to start fixing carbon again. So that's an extremely exciting realm of work, huge financial and business opportunities in it, because eventually we are going to value carbon, it's going to, whether it's soon enough or not. And when people who, who have figured that some of these things out are there can do a verifiable job about it, it can be a lot, be, be a lot of money to be made. Uh, other questions? Oh, for me. Uh, when you do extract CO2 out of the air, where are the places can it go? I heard it can maybe go into agriculture and maybe the soil and some other fuels. Or yeah, so, so I think the, in the work we're doing, we're looking at doing a couple of different things. One is soils can sequester a huge amount. So, and the good news is we work with soils to sequester carbon. The other byproduct is that they produce a lot more green vegetation. So if we produced a lot of green vegetation that we could then put into a sequestered product, like let's just say we were growing hemp that we then turned into a biocarbon fiber that we were building with, then you would actually have actually built soil in the carbon and you would have taken everything from your above ground product and sequestered that too. And then, and then if you took a lot of this forest thinnings that we're gonna to need to do to keep the fire hazards down and you turn that into biochar and put that into the soil, it's basically sequestered for several hundred years and it's holding water. So there's all these things that we need to do to actually enhance the biology to be able to prepare for climate change that actually turn out to be things that will help us a lot here locally. So and that's a whole other conversation which I look forward to having. So anybody left who didn't ask a question that you want to grill me before I go. Thank you so much. You really appreciate your time tonight.